Hi, my name is Muhammad Yassin, and I'm going to discuss today a very interesting topic. I'm going to have you in a tour for like 20 minutes about how I treat obesity and obesity-related surgeries in patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. Obesity is a chronic disease that's increasing in prevalence in adults, adolescents, and children. And it is now considered to be a global epidemic. Current recommendations of, for treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia issued by European Leukemia Net in 2020 doesn't take in consideration the weight of the patient with regard to the doses of different tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Obesity and obesity-related surgeries are emerging and unmet needs, and the aim of this presentation is to shed the light into special categories of patients, and we provide a strategies to treat morbid obese patients with chronic myeloid leukemia, as well as obesity-related surgeries like gastric band sleeve gastrectomy in patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. WHO is defining obesity as follows. They have a specific classification for the obesity. So if your weight body mass index is more than or equal 25 up to 29.9 kg per meter square, you are overweight. If your body mass index more than or equal 30 kilogram per meter square, you are obese. And if you are obese, there are classes for obesity. So there are a class one, class two, and class three. So if your body mass index of 30 up to 34.9 kilogram per meter square, you fall in class one obesity. And if your body mass index of 35 up to 39.9 kilogram per meter square, you fall in class two obesity. And if your body mass index of more than, more than or equal 40 kilogram per meter square, so you fall in class three obesity. Class three obesity, also referred to as severe, extreme, or morbid obesity. What about bariatric surgery and procedure? We have different types of, uh, of bariatric surgeries and procedure, and just I will touch base on this procedure, and then I will speak about two of them in particular because they are the two most common. The first one in which I'm pressing the monitor is, this is a gastric band. The second one is the sleeve gastrectomy. And the third one, this is a raw and Y gastric bypass. And the last one is the duodenal switch. So, the first one, which is very important because it's a quite common and commonly used to reduce the weight. It's called adjustable gastric band technique. And as you can see in the anatomy, this is the esophagus, this is the stomach, and this is a small intestine. And we call it adjustable gastric band because there is a band and the band usually will be in the lower part of the esophagus, in the lower gastroesophageal junction. And it is adjustable because the surgeon can use this device to inflate or to deflate the band. So the laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding technique, the laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding technique is based on a synthetic band placed distal to the gastroesophageal junction just to create a gastric pouch. This procedure, limits the volume of the proximal stomach and therefore restriction of oral intake. This in turn will affect the gastric volume and transit time, which may alter the pharmacokinetics of tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So we are controlling the stomach by a band. When we control it, we will produce a mechanical effect. This mechanical effect will be illustrated as increase in the gas, uh, decreasing in the gastric volume and increasing in the transit time. And as I just illustrated, this may alter the pharmacokinetics 
of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. What about the other procedure? The other procedure is, is sleeve gastrectomy. And sleeve gastrectomy, as you see, a large part of the stomach is removed. And a small part is remained. So this, this remaining part is the, the remaining stomach. So what does a sleeve gastrectomy does? So when we have a sleeve gastrectomy, apparently you notice that the absorbent surface for the medications will be reduced. So if we reduce the absorbent surface, this means the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the medications will definitely be affected. This is the first effect. The second effect, because we are removing a large portion of the stomach and we have this remaining portion, the transit time also will increase. So this also have an impact on the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And third important factor is tyrosine kinase inhibitors are dependent on acidity. So if the pH is lower, tyrosine kinase inhibitors will have a better absorption. If the pH is going higher, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors in general will have less to be absorbed. So when we do a sleeve gastrectomy, the pH will go up. This is one factor. And the other factor, most of those patients undergoing the sleeve gastrectomy, they will be instructed to receive proton pump inhibitors. And this will be an additional factor which can lead to reduce absorption of tyrosine kinase inhibitor in patients with sleeve gastrectomy. Now we are moving to one of our real world cases. And this is a case of morbid obesity, so that we see how we manage these patients. And then we will touch base on the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and also we will touch base on the pharmacology to see and to explain what happened and why did we do this kind of treatment. This is a 27-year-old morbidly obese female. Her weight was 275 kilograms. Her height is 157. 156 centimeter, and body mass index of 113 per kg per meter square. She was found to have a leukocytosis on a routine checkup. The patient's workup, including peripheral smear, fish, and conventional cytogenetics, confirmed the diagnosis of chronic myeloid leukemia in chronic phase. Subsequently, the patient was started on imatinib, 400 milligram once daily. At three months, the patient achieved complete hematological remission, but she didn't achieve the other milestones with regard to cytogenetic and the molecular target. So what we should do for this patient, if you go to the guidelines, there is no any specific recommendations about how to treat class three obesity and what to do for them. And if you are stick to the guidelines, you will call it a failure. So this patient should be switched to second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor. But because this patient is, 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 is very unusual patients, and you can see a lot of patients in the real world with class 3 obesity, we need to check a different approach. So we have decided to do a mutation analysis in this patient to rule out imatinib resistance, primary mutations, and that was negative. And just to, to, uh, to emphasize that in clinical practice, we don't do a mutation analysis for each patient who is failing imatinib. But in this particular case, we did a mutation analysis because we are going to take steps further, as you will see. And due to lack of evidence on how to treat such obese patients, the options were to switch to second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor or to escalate the dose of the imatinib with a close observation. The patient opted for the latter and saw imatinib dose was increased from 400 milligram, increased to 400 milligram twice a day. The patient remained in hematological remission and by her, her next three month assessment, she also showed a major molecular response, which was subsequently maintained. And at one year evaluation, the patient was on deep molecular response. So what recommendations we can make from this case? 
which I believe there is a lot of such case in, in the real world, morbidly obese CML, chronic face patient, starting tyrosine kinase inhibitors as afron therapy may require a higher dose of omatinib or to start with a second degradation tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And probably we need to wait longer. We don't have to stick to the three, six, and 12 month, which is recommended by European Leukemia Unit. And I will show you my justification for this. So this is a diagrammatic schema, which we have made for about how to treat these patients. So if you have a CML morbidly obese, you can start with second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors as upfront, or you can start with imatinib 400 milligram. If you started with imatinib 400 milligram, then it's advisable to check imatinib level if you are practicing in a high resource country and drug level and imatinib level is available. In this condition, if the level is suboptimal, then you can escalate the dose to 600 or even 800 milligram guided by the level. If the level became optimal, then you continue imatinib. So the other scenario, if you are practicing in, in, in a country uh, where you don't have imatinib level or imatinib level cannot be checked or you are in a low resource country, what to do? In this condition, you can just you don't have imatinib level, you can check the PCR able at three months. And then if the PCR is less than 0.1, continue the same dose. And if the PCR level is more than 0.1, you can increase the dose to 600 or 800 milligram, follow with the CBC and PCR. If the patient achieves the target, then you continue. If the patient doesn't achieve the target, then you have to shift to second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Very few studies have addressed the impact of obesity, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics of drug, or described alternations of drug metabolism and clearance in obese patients. It's important to note that CYP3A4 is the major enzyme responsible for metabolism of tyrosine kinase inhibitors the main circulating active metabolite of imatinib is the N-D-methylated bibrazine derivative, formed predominantly by CYP3A4. It shows in vitro potency similar to the parent imatinib. Reduced CYP3A4 metabolic activity and consequently decreased clearance of some of medications has been reported in obese patients. Furthermore, increased gut wall permeability and gastric emptying were observed in obese individuals. This in turn is believed to affect the oral absorption of drugs and nutrients. Alternation of imatinib absorption and or metabolism to the active metabolite may have resulted in reduced exposure to the drug. Increasing the dose above the recommended dose to 600 or 800 milligram may well overcome this phenomenon, as seen in the first patient who achieved a major molecular response following dose escalation. In 2012, Prisha et al. reported a longer median time to achieve complete cytogenetic response, 68 months versus 33 months with a significant p-value. In patients with a body mass index more than 25 kilogram per meter square who had received imatinib as a front therapy. The study also reported a reduced rate of major molecular response, 77% versus 58%, which was also achieved over a longer median time, 29 months versus 14 months, with a significant p-value. Conversely, no significant differences were observed in achieving molecular response with respect to body mass index in patients treated frontline with the second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors, nilotinib and desatinib. The second case is about the gastric band. 
The second case is a 22-year-old gentleman, morbidly obese, with a gastric band. His weight is 166 kg, and his height is 180 centimeter, with a body mass index was 51.23 kilogram per meter square, was newly diagnosed with CML in chronic phase, and started on imatinib, 400 milligram daily. He was considering having a sleeve gastrectomy and seeking medical advice about whether he can go for such procedure with the current diagnosis or to remove the gastric band. Sleeve gastrectomy was not recommended due to both potential for a drastic change in the drug absorption, which could affect treatment efficacy. An alternative option for this patient was to deflate the band. Before the deflation, the patient achieved complete hematological remission, but he didn't reach the molecular target at three months. After the deflation procedure, the patient achieved the molecular target. So, this is a diagrammatic schema for CML, both gastric banding, either to start a second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor to check the level, uh, to start tyrosine, second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, or to start imatinib 400 milligram. If you start imatinib 400 milligram, then you need to check imatinib level and to adjust accordingly. If the imatinib level is not available, as like the previous example, you can do the PCR able at three months, and then you can adjust accordingly as per the scheme. This is a summary of the most common bariatric surgeries and their effect on the drug absorption. The first procedure is the laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding, where a synthetic band placed distal to the gastroesophageal junction to create a gastric pouch this procedure limits the volume of the proximal stomach and therefore restriction of the oral intake. What are the possible effects on the absorption might affect the volume and transit time, which may alter the pharmacokinetics of medication. The second procedure is laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, where a partial gastrectomy, removing the greater curvature creating a tubular gastric conduit. And the possible effect on absorption is reduction in the gastric volume, increase in the gastric pH, and this will accelerate gastric emptying. The third procedure is Ron Y gastric bypass. Here, creating a small gastric pouch in the upper fundus of the stomach, which is then connected to the jejunum, bypassing the most of the stomach and our small intestine. This will reduce the gastric volume, increase the gastric pH, delay gastric emptying, decrease surface of the absorption. The major causes of decreased absorption in patients post bariatric surgery are thought to be a reduced gastrointestinal surface area and increased gastric pH. Drugs that are soluble in an acid environment are more likely to be absorbed in the stomach. I'm not sure. And I it is these that. medications that are likely to be affected in patients who are undergo gastric bypass surgery or sleeve gastrectomy as the gastric surgery production is decreased, leading to decreased solubility and absorption of acid-soluble drugs. Most tyrosine kinase inhibitors exhibit a pH-dependent solubility. Imatinib, nilutinib, and azatinib are soluble in an acid pH. Imatinib and nilutinib solubility rapidly declines above a pH 5.5 and 4.5 respectively. The co-administration of the azatinib with a gastric acid reducing agents can significantly decrease the concentrations of the zatinib with reduced mean area under the curve of the zatinib by up to 61% and the mean Cmax of the zatinib by up to 
person. This table is clearly illustrating the tyrosine kinase solubility. If we took an example, imatinib, imatinib is soluble in aqueous buffer, less than or equal 5.5, very slightly soluble to insoluble in a neutral alkaline aqueous buffer. What about nilutinib? Nilutinib is solubility strongly decreased with increasing pH and is practically insoluble in the buffer solution of pH more than or equal 4.5. What about the zatinib? The zatinib expect a pH dependent aqueous solubility from 18.4 milligram per ml, pH 2.6 to 0 0.008 milligram per ml at a pH of six. So what about the drug levels monitoring? How we are monitoring tyrosine kinase inhibitors? Um, I mean the drug levels monitoring. In taking eye therapy for CML patient, therapeutic drug monitoring is a new strategy for dosage optimization to obtain faster and more effective clinical response. The imatinib plasma trough level concentration C0 should, set, should be set at ab set above 1,000 nanogram per ml to obtain a response and below 3,000 nanogram per ml to avoid serious adverse event such as neutropenia. What about nilutinib and azatinib targets? A target nilutinib C0 of 800 nanogram per ml is recommended. For dazatinib, it's recommended that a higher Cmax or C2 above 50 nanogram per ml to obtain a clinical response and a lower C0, less than 2.5 nanogram per ml to avoid pleural effusion be maintained by once daily administered of dazatinib. What about the UGT1A1? For patients with such genotype, initially administered 300 to 400 milligram per day, a target nilutinib C0 of 500 nanogram per ml is recommended to prevent elevation of bilirubin level. Whereas for patients with the UGT1A1 star one allele initially administered 600 milligram Per day. Although at present clinicians consider the next pharmacotherapy from the clinical response efficacy toxicity obtained by a fixed dose of tyrosine kinase inhibitor, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor dosage should be adjusted based on target plasma concentration to maximize the efficacy and to minimize the incidence of adverse events. This is two of the cases which we have uh, reported in ASH conference. So Yasin et al. reported two cases of morbidly obese with CML, one on dazatinib and the other on nilutinib, and both of them they received it as upfront. Both of them underwent sleeve gastrectomy and have subsequently lost hematological remission. Both patients were switched to imatinib and subsequently achieved complete hematological remission, complete cytogenetic remission, and a major molecular response. So what is our recommendation for patient on the CML on second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors who underwent a sleeve gastrectomy and lost the response? We recommend that switching them to imatinib, they may get benefit from imatinib. And this is also a diagrammatic schema, which is talking about the same scenario. If you have a CML post sleeve gastrectomy and you started imatinib, what to do? If you started second generation TKI, what to do? These are my references. You can go through it. We have uh, multiple publication in the, the, the subject. One is how I treat, which I presented today. And we have also published recently the clinical pathological variables outcome of chronic myeloid leukemia associated with a PCR able one transcript type and body weight. And this is an outcome of European Leukemia Net project. At the end of my presentation, I would like to thank the family of the National Center for Cancer Care and Research, and in particular, the hematology department for their support. 
and I am deeply indebted to International CML Foundation for their kind invitation. Thank you very much.